In the summer of 1964, Paul McCartney of the Beatles had a dream. In his dream was the melody of a song. He woke up and fortunately there was a piano in his room. He immediately played the melody so that he wouldn't forget it. And over the next year, he came up with the lyrics. On September 12, 1965, Paul debuted the song on The Ed Sullivan Show. The rest of the Beatles actually walked off the stage because the song seemed way too soft and sad, and some say they were embarrassed by it. But this song became, and still is, one of the greatest songs of all time. It was the song that moved the Beatles from being a popular band for kids to being a popular band for everyone in the whole world. The song is called Yesterday. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly, I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a shadow hanging over me. Oh, yesterday came suddenly. Yesterday, love was such an easy game to play. Now I need to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. One of the things that makes this song so popular is the way that it connects with our pain and suffering. The troubles we all face, the shadows that hang over us, and the longing to get back to a time when there wasn't all the pain and sorrow. Yesterday raises questions for us. Why do we suffer here? Why all the pain and sorrow? And if God is good, why does he allow suffering? It's a great question probably one that most of us have asked. And it's an important question. Getting an answer to this question can make or break your relationship with God. I want to get real with this conversation. Do you see yourself or someone you love in any of these scenarios? Your life looks so bleak that at times you can't get out of bed in the morning. Everything feels hopeless. And the thought of facing another day is agony. Or your hopes for your marriage have all collapsed and you're left broken and bitter wondering how this happened to you. Or the abuse you endured as a child is like a bad dream that won't go away. It seems to have entangled itself into every area of life. Or you poured your life into your children and had high hopes for them, but it's all gone wrong and now they're only a source of worry and pain. Or you're reeling with the news that you have cancer. Or you lost your mom or a close relative that you couldn't live without. Or the same regrets pounce on you every day as you consider missed opportunities, a missed relationship, and missed chances at real joy. Or maybe nothing is really that bad, but you realize that life doesn't seem to have much meaning and you wonder why there isn't a greater sense of peace and satisfaction in it all. How do we reconcile these real life experiences with the idea that God is a loving God? Well, the Bible can help us. In 1 Peter 2, the apostle Peter is talking to servants as they relate to their masters. 1 Peter 2.18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. 
Let's consider three specific questions we often have when it comes to suffering. Number one, is God judging me when I suffer? Over the first two sessions, we've seen a God who is merciful and loving toward us, even in the midst of our sin and rebellion. Don't get me wrong, the Bible clearly teaches that there will be a judgment when we die. Our suffering actually points to the judgment that is coming. It serves as a warning. But God is not judging us now. He's actually suspending judgment for a later time. So if our suffering in this life is not God's judgment, why do we experience suffering? Well, we suffer because we live in a sinful world, a fallen world. It wasn't always this way. When God created the world, there was no pain or suffering, sickness or trials or disasters. Those things were not part of God's original design. But Adam and Eve tragically turned away from their creator, choosing instead to create their own rules. They sinned. And their disobedience brought sin into the world. Their rebellion brought suffering and sickness and disaster into the entire human race. They tarnished and poisoned the world. We also suffer because others sin against us. And when people sin against us, it causes us to suffer. Verse 19. For this is a gracious or commendable thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What is Peter talking about when he says unjust suffering? It means suffering even though there's nothing you've done to deserve it. And many in the world today experience unjust suffering. Take, for instance, the problem of hunger in the developing world. Children are starving and not getting the nutrition they need. And it's not just because food isn't being sent. Even from our church, we have a program that feeds and cares for close to 2,000 orphans in Africa. One of the reasons food isn't getting to the children is because of the corrupt, sinful leaders who exploit their own people. Corruption creates wars. And wars create famines, and famines create more wars. The results are devastating, bringing suffering to millions of people. But unjust suffering can also hit closer to home. Your child is killed by a drunk driver. Your husband leaves you for another woman. Your identity is stolen. Your parents were unloving or even abusive. Your coworkers or neighbors discriminate against you. These are all examples of unjust suffering, of others sinning against us. We also suffer because of our own sin. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? See, if you do something wrong and you get punished for it and endure the punishment, You don't get extra credit. You deserve it. If you get a ticket for speeding, don't curse under your breath at the cops. Don't kick the dog when you come home. It's your fault. Endure it. Take what you deserve. Now, most of us don't do well with this. We don't like consequences, and we do whatever we can to avoid them. The easiest way to do that is to blame someone else. You probably don't remember the name Stella Liebeck. In 1994, she ordered a 49-cent cup of coffee from a McDonald's drive through in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She placed the coffee between her legs and opened the lid to add cream and sugar. She promptly spilled the whole cup on her lap. And then she promptly sued McDonald's and was awarded $2.8 million from a civil jury. We may not like consequences, but that doesn't mean we don't deserve them. There are consequences when we sin and disobey God. Galatians 6, 7 says, we reap what we sow. If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you sow sin, you're going to reap the consequences of sin. 
Proverbs 19.3 says, A man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. It's often our own foolishness and sin that brings ruin and destruction into our lives. Let me give an example. When I was growing up, my brother and I were really into skateboarding. And there's this trick called an ollie where you jump and kick the board up. My junior year, I did an ollie and landed on a curb, but I fell back and broke my arm. It was a terrible break. But the good news was that I got a cast. So I just kept on skating in the cast. The week that I got the cast off, I did the same move, fell back, and broke my arm again in the same place. My brother and I just sat down on the curb and cried. Even to this day, if you touch my left arm, it still feels like it's broken. And this was decades ago. I was so mad when I broke my arm again that I told my mom that I didn't believe in God anymore. This really panicked my mom. So she called the priest and the priest came over. And that didn't go so well for the priest. But what was my problem? Well, I didn't know Proverbs 19.3. It was my own folly, my own foolishness that brought this about. It was my fault. I was the one that did that trick right after I got my cast off. Yet my heart raged against God. I blamed God. I took it out on God. I punished him for what I did. If you do drugs and alcohol and end up losing everything, Whose fault is it? If you give most of your time to work or hobby and end up in a painful divorce, whose fault is it? If you eat a lot of junk food and end up with poor health, whose fault is it? If you spend hours looking at pornography and you can't seem to have a successful relationship, whose fault is it? We don't like to admit that it's our fault. So we blame others and we blame God. But one of the reasons we suffer is because of our own sin. It's not necessarily because God is judging us. So we often suffer because of sin. Sin in the world, sin others commit against us, and sin we commit ourselves. Here's a second question that people often have when it comes to suffering. Is God able to redeem my suffering? In other words, is God able to use my suffering for good? Or is it all just meaningless? And we just have to get used to the idea that all our troubles are here to stay. Well, the Bible teaches that God allows and even brings suffering for our good. God can actually use suffering for your good. There are several ways that he does that. One is that suffering can bring us to God. You know, one of the primary reasons that God allows trials and difficulties is to draw men and women to himself. When you don't have many trials, when things are going your way, it's hard to see your need for God. But when you suffer, you begin to see your own weakness and frailty and sin And this can help you see your need for God, that you need help. I know that many of you are in the midst of suffering or some sort of trial. Maybe God has used that to bring you to the bridge course. That's a good thing. Suffering can bring you to God. But it doesn't have to. Many who suffer just get angry at God and write him off, like I did when I broke my arm. Others are confused and disillusioned and and simply ignore God and drift away. But God can use trials to drive you to himself. What trial are you going through? Where are you suffering? Maybe God isn't judging you or trying to make your life miserable. Maybe he's trying to get your attention and bring you to himself. So suffering can bring us to God. Suffering can also bring maturity. God wants Christians to be more like him, to grow in maturity. And the way that happens is through trials. 
I wish it were different, but the Bible says again and again that trials equal growth. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, what is James talking about? Why would we consider trials pure joy? Not just regular run-of-the-mill joy, but pure joy. He tells us, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Trials develop perseverance in our lives. And that perseverance matures us and forces us to grow. Jerry Bridges tells a story about this in his book, Trusting God. One of the many fascinating events in nature is the emergence of the cecropia moth from its cocoon, an event that occurs only with much struggle on the part of the moth to free itself. The story is told of someone who watched a moth go through this struggle. In an effort to help and not realizing the necessity of the struggle, the viewer snipped the shell of the cocoon. Soon the moth came out with its wings all crimped and shriveled. But as the person watched, the wings remained weak. The moth, which in a few moments would have stretched those wings to fly, was now doomed to crawling out its brief life in frustration of ever being the beautiful creature God created it to be. What the person in the story did not realize was that the struggle to emerge from the cocoon was an essential part of developing the muscle system of the moth's body and pushing the body fluids out into the wings to expand them. By unwisely seeking to cut short the moth's struggle, the watcher had actually crippled the moth and doomed its existence. Do you think a good parent gives their children everything they want? No. Sometimes they'll let their child struggle, do things the child doesn't understand. And it's the same with God. God lets us struggle. He doesn't always give us what we want. And there are things he does that we don't understand. But if we belong to God, he will use our struggles and suffering for our good. Suffering can also bring a longing for a better place. God can use suffering to make us long for our true home. If this world was all there is to life, then suffering would seem meaningless at best and cruel at worst. But this world is not all there is. You were not created for this world, for ultimate satisfaction in this world. You were created for a person and a place. That person is Jesus and that place is heaven. This place is temporary. We're meant to be pilgrims just passing through. This isn't meant to be heaven. But we often try to make earth heaven. So God sends trials to detach us from the earth, to make us long for our true home, a better home. Every morning I have to stretch my back and my neck Whenever I play sports, I pull my hamstring. I've had surgery on both shoulders. I have a permanent bicep tendon strain. I've had terrible allergies my whole life. I've broken several bones, had tons of stitches. My eyesight is terrible and my memory is shot. And I'm not even that old. I can't imagine what I'm going to be like later on. Oh, and several years ago, I even got gout. I thought I broke my toe, but the doctor told me I had gout. I told him that this isn't the 1800s and I'm not that old. But man, was it ever painful. God's goal for us in our short time on earth is not just temporary happiness. It's to prepare us for eternity, to make us long for our true home. So we can see that some suffering is caused by sin, the sinful world, the sin of others, and our own sin. We also see that God can use suffering to bring us to himself, to mature us, 
and to cause us to long for a better place. These things can help us make sense out of some of our suffering, but not all. There are times when we will suffer and it doesn't make any sense. You can't see any reason for it or any good that can come of it. There is mystery in suffering. Things we cannot understand on this side of eternity. And we don't like mystery. We want answers. But if we understood everything, wouldn't that make us God? It makes sense that there would be mystery when it comes to God. We shouldn't be able to understand all that he does, just like a child can't understand all that a parent does. There is mystery when it comes to suffering. That brings us to the third question people often have when it comes to suffering. Is God there when I suffer? Because it doesn't seem like it. It can feel like we're all alone. Suffering can come in small packages. You can't find your phone, the car broke down again, you can't pay your bills, you failed the test, your back hurts, your three-year-old refuses to be potty trained. It can come in large packages. The tumor is malignant. The relationship is over. The accident is fatal. Suffering leaves us vulnerable and helpless. What do you do? You can't change it, you can't escape it. You look for reasons, but you're left with none. You blame yourself, you blame others, you blame God. You think, where is God? I thought he wasn't supposed to let this kind of stuff happen. We can feel like we're doing the best job that we can with the cards that have been dealt to us. And then suffering comes and God doesn't seem to come through. Well, maybe he does come through, but in a way we didn't expect. We talked about how sometimes when we suffer in this life, we can look back and see why the suffering makes sense. When my brother and I were four years old, a terrible tragedy happened in my family. My dad caught my mom cheating on him with one of his best friends who he also worked with. So my dad, who was a rough guy that struggled with alcohol, went to work and shot that guy and then came home and shot my mom and then shot himself in our kitchen. My brother and I were too young to remember any of this, but it devastated our family. My one grandmother became an alcoholic. But because of this tragedy, my brother and I were adopted by my aunt and uncle. Looking back, I can see how God took us out of a very bad situation and put us in a much better one. But sometimes we suffer in this life and we can't see why. It makes no sense. My wife, Trish, lost her dad to cancer when she was nine years old. I want to read you part of her mom's journal. Her name is Naomi, and her husband's name was Ira. They grew up in a little town called Shenick, Pennsylvania. They lived in a little trailer with a pink stripe. They didn't have a lot of money, but they had saved up, and her dad was building a small house for them. He had moved the trailer up on blocks and was constructing this house when the cancer hit. Trish remembers him laying on a pile of two by fours, trying to regain strength. Finally, he went to the doctor. And then Naomi writes, my sister and I took you into the ER at Lancaster General Hospital. You were admitted. The nightmare begins. A horrible, ugly word casts a dark shadow on the whole world. The doctor asks my sister if she thinks I'm prepared to be told my husband has cancer. My sister says, yes, so they tell me. But my heart and mind shout, no, God, you can't do this. They're doing all manner of tests to discover your problem, and nothing shows up. Then on the fourth day, the CAT scan shows the evil thing, a tumor grown around the spinal column, hardly accessible for surgery. Dr. Pohl comes to talk to me, He explains things and offers no hope. The verdict, he will die of this tumor. I hear the very words spoken I could not even form in my mind. It was August 15th, 1979. Black, black day. 
My heart is so heavy, it seems I can't physically carry it around. It weighs about two tons, it seems. I pull back from God's gentle leading. Oh God, no, I don't wanna go this way. It's dark and unfamiliar. I like to walk where my surroundings are familiar and comfortable and I can see where I'm going. Please don't take me this way. And God gently answers, yes. I know the way is dark and unfamiliar to you, but I am here by your side, holding your right hand. My arms of love will keep you from falling. So I go along unwillingly, railing against him in anger sometimes like a spoiled child, but he keeps his promise. He never lets go of my hand or leaves my side. Now, one really amazing part of the story was the small church that they were part of and the way that church cared for them. Each Saturday over the fall, while Ira was sick in the trailer, the church would gather at the house and the ladies would make a big lunch and the men would work on the house all day. They did this every weekend until just before Christmas when they finished. She says, finally, everything that has taken up all our energy, time and effort is coming to a climax. The rugs are in, the curtains are up. We bundle you up in a sleeping bag and tie you with a sheet to a chair to keep your back straight. And you're carried out of our old trailer into our new house. They set down the chair. Everyone steps back and you look around with an expression of wonder on your face. Then you begin to thank our friends and you're overwhelmed. You put your hand over your eyes and begin to weep. You are not a person given to shedding of tears. And when I see you weep, I go over to you and press your face against mine, and our tears flow together. Shortly after they moved in, on the other side of Christmas, Ira rapidly declines. Naomi says, swallowing has become very difficult for you. It gets worse during the day so that by evening you can't swallow at all. You've stopped eating. And when I look at your dear face, I can clearly see your skull outlined your eyes set down deep in bony ridges, those arms which were so strong and capable of much hard work, which once so expertly wielded a tennis racket, smashing balls across the net from the farthest corner of the court, are now no bigger than a broomstick. But we haven't come to grips with it and look death in the face. I know I must face it, so I force myself to say aloud, he's going to die. I go to you later that evening and we talk about it and just have a sweet, precious time together. You say, let's pray. So I pray first, then you pray. I go to bed knowing the Lord will take you very soon. My heart breaks, but I feel strangely relieved because I have let go. I have relinquished my tight hold on you and released you to God's perfect will, even if that perfect will is death. It was so hard giving you up. I loved you so very much, my dear Ira. I sit with you with my arm under your neck and watch your dear face. You're struggling with some fluid in your throat, but you're not in any agony. Finally, you start drawing long, deep breaths with a long pause between. I listen, not daring to breathe myself, because I know one of these breaths will be your last. You draw a breath, I wait and wait, and I know this very instant your soul is winging into glory. You've left this bed of suffering, you're free. But how I wish I wasn't left behind. Thank you, God, for working everything out so marvelously so that we could have them a little while longer. Thank you for our lovely Christmas. Thank you that dad got to enjoy our house with us. Thank you for the quality of life he enjoyed, that he didn't suffer like some cancer patients. Thank you for not taking him at a time when I couldn't be with him. Thank you for so many things. How, how can someone say this? How can they trust God with something like this? Because God suffers with us. 
God's not watching from a distance, removed from the suffering of the world and unaffected. He's not a cold, cruel judge who doesn't care about what we're going through. No, God suffers with us. He enters into our suffering and he weeps with us in our time of pain and grief. The shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five, 35, where it says, Jesus wept. Jesus was in front of the tomb of Lazarus, one of his closest friends who had died four days earlier. Jesus was close to this family, including his sisters, Mary and Martha. He was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And when Jesus got there and he saw all the weeping and all the crying and all the pain, it just says Jesus wept. He didn't say, hey, stop, stop, hold up. I'm, I'm gonna raise him from the dead in a second. You don't have to feel bad. He didn't do that. He wept. He wept because he enters into our suffering. But that's not all. God doesn't just suffer with us. He suffers for us. How did he suffer? By hanging on a Roman cross for six hours. Why did he do this? Why did he suffer? Verse 24, he himself, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus was not dying for his own sins. He was dying for our sin, bearing our sin. He took our penalty for his own. If you're angry about unjust suffering, then you should be most angry that Jesus suffered on the cross. He did not deserve to die on a cross. He did not deserve God's wrath. Because of our sins against God, we deserve God's wrath. We deserve death and separation from him. But most of the time we receive mercy. We don't get what we deserve. It's the mercy of God that our heart beats through the night, that we have food, clothes, and a place to live. But there will come a day when you will die and stand before God, and he will set all accounts with you. And if you have not repented and trusted fully in Christ, you will meet with his justice. Our suffering in this life is a small taste of the suffering that is to come. It points to future judgment. So what do you do? Let me go back to my mother-in-law. The reason my mother-in-law could find peace and hope in the midst of such a trial is that she had a need even greater than keeping her husband alive. That need was to be forgiven of her sin and rebellion against God. Jesus took her place on the cross so that she wouldn't have to suffer the penalty she deserved for her own sin. On the cross, Jesus purchased for her the gift of God's forgiveness. And when she was 23 years old, she received that gift by repenting and surrendering her life to Christ. And you can do the same thing. Remember that at the center of Christianity is suffering a savior hanging on a bloody cross. So it makes sense that followers of Christ would suffer too. We're following a crucified savior. Our suffering points to the effects of our sin and the judgment to come, but it also points to the towering love of Christ who was willing to suffer unimaginable pain for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven and escape the suffering and judgment to come.